Hey, Bert, what you working on? <laughs> well, I'm working on this presentation, but it's been a while since I've done one with a live audience as opposed to being able to edit out my mistakes. So <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Okay, so are we ready? All right. Uh, I always start out my videos and I say, hi, my name's Jeff. I'm from the Ozark Mountains in Missouri. Uh, the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey used to say, is I grew up about... I don't know, 15 miles up Route 68 here in Champaign County. So you notice on the little blurb that they said, they said I was from Woodstock. Yep, that's where I was born. So, but I spent most of my adult life down in the Ozarks. And I started the videos that way because I didn't know what to say for the life of me on my first video. And that's what came out of my mouth and <laughs> it's stuck. So what I'm here to talk about today is uh, repairing our vintage computers and we all kind of probably got back into it the same way, right? You're like, oh, I had that computer as a kid. I wanted that computer as a kid. You find the computer, you know, at your mom and dad's house in the attic or something, and, and it, it doesn't work. You know, you buy it on eBay, and it doesn't work. And then you jump on the forums, and you're like, hey, I've got a black screen, or I've got garbage on the screen, or whatever. And there's a lot of people who try to help you. And sometimes it's helpful, and sometimes you get things like, hey, I had something like that, and I replaced, you know, chip M7. And you wind up kind of taking this Easter egg approach, you know, like with old vacuum tubes, and just replaced a bunch of parts, and hopefully it'll work. And that pains me to see people struggling like that, uh, especially because even if you're used to soldering and desoldering, anytime you take parts off and on an old circuit board, you run the risk of damaging something. And if you're not uh, familiar with it, if you're a beginner, that is a really high risk. So the more we can do to make an educated guess as to what the part that's bad might be before we start taking stuff off the board, usually the better off we are. So uh, the technical term for this is a systematic approach, which just means doing something logically, you know, starting in a logical order that'll hopefully lead you to where you wanna go. Uh, a good example is, when you lose your car keys, rather than running around your whole house and property looking at a random spot for your car keys, you start from the beginning. You're like, oh, okay, I, I came in with the groceries and I unlocked the front door and you go look in the front door and you didn't leave the keys there. But you know, I have done that before. Uh, and they're like, okay, I put the groceries away and you go to the kitchen and you don't see them and you're thinking, all right, you know, I, I went to put my coat up. Oh, and then the phone rang and yeah, I, I stopped at the kitchen table to take a note, and there you find your keys. So we wanna take a logical systematic approach like that when we're trying to fix our computers. And oh, there's one other thing is that, uh, this is just a guideline, it's not like GPS coordinates. You know, uh, we're bound to make wrong turns, that's okay, you can turn around, start over again at a certain point. Uh, First thing to start out with is the four senses. Uh, you know, this is all part of it. You could say this is part of a visual inspection, but we're using our four senses. But you know, does it smell? Does the computer smell musty? Does it smell burnt? You know, if it has a musty smell, it might have been sorted in a damp location. There might be some corrosion on things. That happens a lot, and that's a very good thing to look for. If it smells burnt. You know, you just got this thing off of eBay and it smells burnt. Somebody might have tried to power it up before and that could have done some damage. That is very likely. Uh, sense of sight. What do you see on the circuit board? Are there parts missing? Again, with a lot of the used stuff we find, there's going to be parts missing. Somebody may have tried to work on it before and not done a very good job. And there can be stuff out of sockets, bent pins on chips. There can be bent pins on chips from the factory and it made good enough connection to work for years that way. And sound, when you get to the point of turning it on, does it beep and boop when it's supposed to beep and boop? Um, sometimes like on our Model 100s here, even if nothing's on the screen, you can type in beep, and if it beeps back at you, you know it's running, it's just not displaying anything. And the sense of taste. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Don't, don't taste your old computer, okay? <laughs> uh, 
Um, I, I've been tempted, like, I don't know, is that like battery leaking or whatever, but I've, I've fought off the urge so far. The, the first set of checks I always do, I call PCR, power clock and reset. These are the big three that the computer has to have to run. And if you don't have these things, it's not going to run. Power, of course, um, is the one most people are familiar with. That's plugging into the wall. You may have an internal or external power supply. They can look something like this. I think this is from a Coco one, correct me if I'm wrong. Coco three, okay, I know it's from a Coco. Um, forgive the blasphemy, C64 type external power supply. The thing is they come in different shapes and sizes. They will have different output voltages. They may take AC in and give you DC out. They may give you AC and DC out. So it just depends on the particular computer that you're looking at. Ideally, we would test these power supplies without them connected to the computer, but under load. So we can make sure they're working good before we plug them into the computer. Sometimes that is really, really tough. Um, there are some old computers where the power supply is built onto the main board and you can't disconnect them, right? And you've got some of these RAM chips will take five volts, plus five volts, minus five volts, and 12 volts. And when they, the, chip, the RAM chips go bad, they tend to short all three rails together. And you, know, you don't wanna send 12 volts until the rest of your five volt components if you can avoid it. Um, but ideally, if we can, at least unplug it and check it to make sure the open circuit voltage looks reasonable. If you can't do anything else, that's the first step. Uh, clock. There are all sorts of different clock circuits. You'll see this type of circuit with a few inverter gates in various types of old equipment. Uh, it looks very simple. Uh, sometimes people say, well, can I test, you know, here at the crystal? You can't test at the crystal. You'll load this down. You have to test somewhere like here with a proper piece of equipment. Uh, Clock circuits can vary, very quite wildly. On the Model 100, this is an ADC85 processor. It has the crystal driving circuitry built into the processor. So it's just hanging off the end of the processor. So there's not a lot there to go wrong. If the crystal's good, there's not a problem with the caps or traces or something like that. There's nothing left but the processor. And you'll see, if I didn't cut it off in this picture. Yeah, I did, I don't see the clock out. Anyhow, there'll be a, a clock out of there to the rest of the system. And it can go all the way to some really confusing stuff like this with lots of different clocks and a PLL circuit made out of discrete components. Again, sorry, it's a C64, but this is kind of representative of what you see in a lot of things. Um, Check, check, check. Okay. All right, yep, yeah, see, it's always the power. Um, yeah, so clock circuits and very wildly, it's the type of thing you may need uh, an oscilloscope to check. Some meters will have a frequency check function, which is a whole lot better than nothing. But if the clock isn't running, the computer's not gonna run. This is like the drum beat that everything else follows, so it's gotta be there. Reset, um, this is another big one. Again, I think this is a Coco one, correct me if I'm wrong. This is a very simple RC circuit. There's not a lot that's gonna go wrong with that. This may not be adequate for every system that's out there. 
You can have systems like our C64 that'll use a 555 or 556, and there can be everything in between those two things. Um, On our Model 100, the reset circuit is very complex because it's integrated in with the low power shutdown. It's got some extra stuff it's got to worry about to make sure that the battery back RAM is starting up properly and not getting scrambled. And it also has the auto power off to be concerned with. So this whole block highlighted in yellow is all the reset circuitry. And it ties in through this transistor here up to the power supply where it can shut the power supply down. Uh, there's a lot that can go wrong there. Now, as an example, when I got here today and I hooked up all this mess to this Model 100, it did not work. I got my multimeter and I checked power. Uh, the plus five volts and minus five volts were just a little low, about 4.85 volts, not too bad. You know, still where I would probably think that isn't the problem. I checked the reset circuit, it was held low. So I'm like, okay, slightly low voltage, reset circuit held low. It's probably a power condition. This thing is sensing the low voltage, which is kind of done up at the top here. I've kind of cut off in this picture. And sure enough, the rechargeable lithium batteries I put in it, one of them was bad. It was really hot. Took those out, threw in some regular alkalines. Everything was fine. Um, some common faults, like in a reset circuit, uh, I've seen bad capacitors, you know, leaking capacitor, it's not timing right. You may get a varied reset pulse. Sometimes it may work, sometimes it may do silly things when it starts up because that reset circuit is telling all the chips connected to it. We're just starting out. It, they're going to reset all of the registers to a known state so when everything starts up, it's going to work properly. Without that, everything is starting up, all the registers in a random state, and it may do something silly. It may not work at all, it may be a black screen or a gray screen or whatever the, the color of the screen is where things aren't working right on your particular computer. Uh, the next step, if our first step of checks didn't reveal anything, is BADS, bus address decoding and chip selects. The address and data bus has lots of different chips connected to it. And they all have to share and they have to play nice with each other. And they often don't do that. And you can imagine being in a room with 100 kindergartners all screaming at you at the same time. That's what the bus can be like if things aren't playing nice. So the, the job of the address decoding is to look at what the computer's trying to talk to, to interpret all those signals, and say, oh, I'm trying to talk to RAM now, right? Or I'm trying to talk to this I.O. chip, or I'm trying to talk to the, and scan the keyboard. And if the address decoding is not working right, it may select the wrong chip at the wrong time. And of course, something silly is going to happen. So the address decoding has given us our chip selects. And an example here is on our Model 100. We have our 8085 processor. We have our lower uh, address and data lines. You know, they're labeled 80 0 through 87 are feeding over to some latches, as well as the upper bits. Now on this particular processor, it gets more complicated because it's sharing the lower eight bits of the address bus with the data bus. Uh, that's called multiplexing, and it just means they're using the same pins at different times for multiple purposes. And it makes our jobs trying to figure out what's going wrong harder. Uh, because we'll have all sorts of these latch chips that are like taking a snapshot of the bus activity at that particular slice of time to save it for whatever function is going on. Like it might be trying to scan the keyboard. So it's gonna say, here is the row I want to scan or the column I want to scan on the case of the M100 as I recall. And so the latch chip is gonna keep that there and then it's gonna read from the rows Right, and you can't hang up the data bus for the column, so you have to have that latch in there. And this was about three o'clock in the morning. I couldn't sleep one night, and uh, this particular machine, I had completely missed this problem earlier in the day. And like I said, there's no GPS to guide you. I had to back up 
go back to basics, look at all these things, look at all my address and data signals with the oscilloscope. And I saw this. This signal with this little spike here that looks really odd, that is the result of that multiplexing I was talking about. When it's deciding it's going to change the purpose for those pins, you might get really odd things like this. Uh, even on other parts of the system where you see a, a chip changing functions on part of the bus, you'll get a little spike like that. Um, it doesn't matter because the computer's not trying to read anything from the, the, the data bus or address bus at that time. It's like if you stuck your tongue out at your teacher, as long as she didn't see you, it didn't matter, right? But if she's looking, if the computer was looking for something right here and this tongue was sticking out, bad things are going to happen. This particular top trace with this stair step effect um, is what's called bus contention. Two things are trying to talk on the same line at the same time. And when I actually made this video, I said bus convention, and then a few minutes later realized that I said the wrong word. And, you know, just based on the functionality of the machine, this is really hard to tell what's going on. The only way that you can really do it is using the oscilloscope and taking a look at all the signals. And when I get a weird problem like this, I'll look at all the address lines, all the data lines, and make sure it looks reasonable. I don't know that it's correct. I don't know what it's doing or what function it's doing, but I know that it's not this. And interestingly, on this particular machine, it mostly worked. And why won't we play this? Might do it. Yes. So you can see the corruption that's on the screen. There's some missing spots. And if it'll let me skip forward. Yeah. Anyhow, this was a really odd one because the machine mostly worked, but there was graphical corruption, and you normally think, hey, this is a screen problem. It's an LCD problem or something like that. Uh, when I noticed that uh, bus conflict, I went, and sometimes you can say, okay, it's these two particular data lines, right? What chips have those in common? And you can kind of narrow down what the fault might be. Uh, in this particular case, it was like between uh, lines, address, data lines, two, five, and seven, and which go to everything. So then my next step was, well, okay, what is the easiest to pull out of the system, right? I don't want to pull the processor because that's difficult. There's a lot of pins. Well, there was two latches, neither of which was required for the computer to run. One was for the keyboard, one was for the RS-232. I pulled the keyboard first, still did this, pulled the one the latch for the RS-232 port, the screen was fine. So um, sometimes when you get down to an either or thing, you go with the easiest solution first. You know, if the 16 pin chip or 14 pin chip can be it just as likely as the 40 pin chip, the smaller chip is probably cheaper too if you mess it up trying to take it out. And it's certainly easier to pull. Uh, when we get to stage three, when none of these things have worked, this is where you get into the really crazy stuff. Um, and unless we've already gone through stage one and stage two, none of these things make any difference. So uh, things I'll see on the forums a lot is somebody will say, I got a diagnostic ROM for my machine, or I got a test cartridge, and I plugged it in, and it still doesn't work. It's like, well, you know, if you don't have voltage getting to the video chip, it doesn't matter what you've got plugged into it. It's just not going to work. You know, if you don't have a clock or if your reset's stuck, it's not going to work. So this part doesn't matter. When we know we have all those basic building blocks and things look like they should work, you know, we have bus activity, yada, yada. This is when we get into these things. And these can be such a wonderful diagnostic aid. You can get along without them, but there are certain problems that will eat your lunch if you don't have something like this to use, and it'll take you five minutes if you do. 
Uh, this screenshot right here is from a little eight channel logic analyzer. And I had problems with this Model 100. This is the first one I ever got, which was broken because, you know, that's how old equipment is. It's broken. And it would not boot. Uh, it wasn't even getting to the point of resetting the LCD. So it was somewhere early in the boot process. And, you know, there was address and data signals at times when it was trying to boot. So it looked like everything was kind of there, but who knows what it is after that point. And since I didn't have this fancy test harness, which we'll talk about in a little bit, I hooked up my logic analyzer, which is only eight channels. So I had to use the seventh channel as kind of a, a sync signal to let me know when the ROM was being read from, because I was trying to uh, capture the signals being read out of the ROM so I knew what code was being run. And then I turned this uh, into hex values in each sync signal and went through a disassembly I found on the line for the uh, part of the ROM for the Model 100 where it was booting and found out that it copies a little bit of the ROM into RAM so it can run some self-modifying code. And that part it was copying was overriding the stack so when it tried to return from doing that copying, it went somewhere crazy. And it was a little different every time. And this was very difficult to find this way. This is like the hardest way possible to go about doing that. But it is possible because we don't have testing aids for every mid-inch computer out there. And if you have a analyzer with more channels, it's easier than what I had to go through here. So this is just showing this setup here. Um, this little board here will run a series of tests at a very low level first, and it'll first test out all the RAM chips to see if they're good. And only when it finds at least one good RAM module will it then start uh, running more extensive code that can make use of the stack. Because before that, you can't use the stack. You can't uh, do any looping or anything like that. It's just not available, so it's a lot of boilerplate assembly code, you know, doing the same thing in line to test all that out. And it has this little LCD here that's memory mapped that it can write to as a means of providing output to the user, which is really nice. And something like this, since it does that RAM test to start with, it'll tell you in the first five minutes once you hook it up if the RAM module is good. And the RAM modules on these, this one is always soldered in. And on the later machines, these other two might have been. And they're a pain to remove. They didn't do thermal isolation on the pads on these. It makes them really difficult to desolder. I wind up with like a, a hair dryer type uh, heating gun to preheat the board in that area so you can desolder it. It's very difficult to work on. Uh, the other advantage to a test harness like this is you get some automated testing of the I.O. ports. This will test the expansion bus, the serial bus, the cassette relay. Um, if you hook up a cassette and press the right button at the right time, it'll even check the in and out to the cassette deck. Uh, here I've got the keyboard and LCD hooked up, so it actually has a key test function in, in the screenshot we saw earlier was actually the LCD output it does. Um, the way I have this configured here, I'll try to tip this up so everybody can see it. It has a loop back for the keyboard and a little dongle that plugs in where the LCD goes. And the, both of these are loop backs, so it'll loop the signals back so it can check the signal integrity up to those connectors which is very handy, especially for the LCD, because the LCD not working is a big problem on these machines. And uh, the guy that made this even put some comparators on here, so it'll check that the voltage is good. At the same time, gives you a quick visual indication. These things can be a big, big time saver. And when I'm work especially when I'm working on somebody else's machine, I like to know that not only what they sent it for is fixed, but that there's not some other problem they're going to find later when I send it back to them. So it's really nice to be able to run tests like that. Uh, there are similar things for other computers, you know, from a, a ROM that'll run diagnostic test and flash the screen or something if it finds bad RAM. 
or that will have like an RS-232 loopback, that type of thing. Let's see how we doing on time. Okay, um, tools. This is the, you know, I'm really heavily into this. I have a lot of tools dedicated to this part of the hobby of repairing the, the computers. Um, it's not everybody's thing and not everybody has all the tools already. So if it's something you're interested in getting started with, you know, there's tools you need to get started, you know, your, your basic tool set. And there are more advanced tools, you know, that you can add in as you go. You know, the big things are hand tools, uh, multimeter, soldering equipment, and in lieu of a logic analyzer or uh, oscilloscope, a logic probe. Hand tools, most everybody has hand tools. Um, you know, screwdrivers, a selection of screwdrivers, things like that, wire strippers. Uh, none of it has to be fancy. I have, I bought some really expensive wire strippers which didn't turn out to be that good and I still use my, you know, cheap $10 set for a lot of things. Multimeter. Um, I've had this multimeter made by Triplet for more than 20 years. It's a decent meter. Um, it's not fancy. It doesn't have a lot of stuff built into it, but it does a good job. Uh, a decent meter is your friend, and a, the cheap $5 meter from Harbor Freight is more like a friend of me. Uh, a lot of times they don't work that great, but it's better than nothing. If you're doing low voltage stuff, even a cheap meter will do a good job. When you get into working on mains voltages, a cheap meter can be a bomb in your hand. They don't have good uh, over voltage protection or explosion protection to keep anything going wrong from coming out of the case into your hand. Uh, there is a thread on the EEV blog forum where guys go through and review meters. And I mean, you can get a really, really, really good meter these days for less than 50 bucks. Uh, so it's, you don't have to spend two or three hundred dollars on a multimeter. You can get a, a really good one for that price. Um, component testers. This component tester I bought as a kit for like ten bucks several years ago. There are much fancier ones now that have a graphical LCD and they come with a case for twenty bucks. Um, these are the type of things, it's like a no, no go tester. Right, you've seen a manufacturing where they'll have two different size pins and one should fit in a hole and one shouldn't. That's kind of what this guy is. I compared this though to some of our fancy uh, capacitor testing equipment at work and it was within a few percent for things like ESR. So good enough, you know, because what we're going to find in our old equipment, you know, when the capacitors go bad, the ESR is out in left field somewhere, right? The capacitance is way off. We're not looking for you know, uh, half percent variance in what the rating was for a specific capacitor, you know, when we're testing it for manufacturing or something. I did actually did a whole video where I troubleshot my espresso machine using nothing but this, just to see if it would work. And it actually did a good job because it'll do, you know, like uh, small SCRs and triacs and things like that. So it, it, I was surprised, but it did a good job. Yeah. Uh, it will test, you just hook up the leads, you like it to a transistor, you hook up the three leads in any order and you press the button and it'll look at it and go, oh, that looks like a transistor. You know, you hook up two random leads to a two leaded component and it'll look at it and go, oh, that looks like a capacitor of this value with this ESR, or it looks like a resistor, or, or it looks like a diode that's polarized this way. So, you know, like I said, not the most accurate thing in the world, but boy, is it handy. Now, you know, a lot of times on your multimeters, it'll have a diode mode and you can check things like that. But this will do it really fast and it's a good enough answer for our purposes. Uh, logic probe. This was purchased at Radio Shack in Marysville, Ohio in about 1984. Still have it. Still works. It's still handy. Even with fancier tools, it's handy because it's quick and it's easy and it tells you the answer that you need. Uh, this, you hook it up to power it from your circuit board, 
you poke this thing onto the signal that you're wanting to test and it'll tell you if it's high or low or changing. And a lot of times that's all you need to know. And they still make models that look exactly like this. Soldering, you kind of get into an area where you can spend just as much money as you want to spend. This was bought about the same time. This is a solder sucker. You push that down, you heat up the solder with your soldering iron, and you do that to suck it up. This is an okay one. Um, of course, I, I wore it out, and this has parts in it from a newer, cheaper plastic version. It wasn't very good, but I was able to scrounge the parts to fix this old one. And it still works okay. It's still sitting right out on my bench because I use it on occasion. There are versions of this that have a silicone tip that are, actually work really good. You know, and it's, it's something that's like less than 20 bucks. So if you don't have the money for a, you know, vacuum desoldering tool, that'll still do the job. There's also a solder braid, which is like a flat copper mesh wire with uh, some flux inside. Even if you have fancy desoldering tools, that should still be on your workbench. It'll get blobs of solder off of surfaces and things and off of pads and make it nice and flat. It's great stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's one of those things you got to try to hold it and use it at the same time and it, yeah, that can be tricky. Sources for tools. There's places like, I think this was from Adafruit. Um, it's a kit they have with some basic hand tools and, you know, a, a cheap meter and soldering iron that's decent, right? If you don't have anything, you can pick up a kit like this. It'll get you started and, you know, let you put some things together. Um, my kind of basics for a soldering iron is to be temperature controlled, uh, you know, temperature adjustable. The temperature control kind of depends on the quality of the iron, but again, there's some really decent ones now for not a lot of money. You, you don't, how do I say, it? the easiest way to really mess up your circuit board is to use a really shoddy, so, uh, shoddy soldering iron because you won't be able to you know, transfer the heat properly and you'll wind up overheating the joint trying to get it hot enough just to desolder. So it's a good thing you know, to, to uh, spend a little bit of money on. The thing with a kit like this from like Adafruit or SparkFun, normally you can have a higher confidence that the stuff is okay. It's of decent quality. It may not be the best stuff in the world, but it's decent than if you buy something random from eBay. You know, because these guys want to protect their reputation. And they're... Yeah, yeah, they have a whole selection of like really good irons for less than 50 bucks. When we get into advanced tools, you have things like an oscilloscope, uh, the logic analyzer. This is the one, this, I don't know, this is like 10 years old. It was about 100 bucks at the time. It's eight channels, it's USB, it does the job. There are clones of this because they use basically an off-the-shelf IC and wrote some fancy software to do all the stuff. The software is wonderful. This is a Salee. Um, so somebody cloned the hardware. Yeah. And you can get fancier desoldering tools. But even still, the solder braid is a great thing to have in your toolkit. Um, oscilloscopes. This is another tool you can spend as much money as you want to spend on. And they can be super, super complex to operate because they can do all sorts of things now. They just have everything built in. Do all sorts of math on the signal, have multiple channels. This is a cheap 30 megahertz one I bought on sale for $200 several years ago. I still keep this one because it's battery powered. It's got a, a battery in it. And if you're working on like switch mode power supplies, you don't want your oscilloscope plugged into the wall um, because the oscilloscope ground is connected to earth. So you wind up shorting out your power supply trying to work on it, which is bad news. So this is, you know, it's a decent scope. It was inexpensive at the time what I could afford. Uh, before that I had a Tektronix like 465, it was a portable scope made back in the 1980s. It was only 10 megahertz, but it worked. 
right? It wasn't fancy, but it did the job for a one megahertz, you know, CPU computer. It was okay. Uh, logic an analyzers like this, the USB things, these are very inexpensive today. It requires a bit more knowledge of the computer to make sense of what you're seeing because you have to know what all the signals are supposed to be. But it can be an indispensable tool sometimes. Um, Desoldering stuff. Okay. Heiko makes good stuff, and they have for years. So we have Heiko, and we have Heiko clones, and we have clones of Heiko clones. And they all look the same, right? Um, there, are, there are some of the clones that are great tools, and there are some that are a fire waiting to happen. Um, of course, Heiko is more expensive, but if you ask somebody that's bought one what the quality was like and where they got it, right, and it's a dealer that you know you're going to get the same thing from, the next time, then that's a good way to go. And these are a decent desoldering tool. The thing is with any desoldering tool like this, you gotta clean it. You gotta clean it all the time and you gotta keep it clean. Or it'll plug up inside and then you'll be really, really mad at it because you're trying to get something done and it's completely plugged up with solder. You know, it's, it's you're heating the solder down here and sucking it up into this chamber, right? And there's some of it's gonna hang out right here Right, and not get sucked completely up in there. And then you're going to shut this off, and you're going to have this cold lump of solder in there. And then the next solder you try to suck up is going to get stuck on that. So it's one of those things. If you use it just once or twice, you probably don't. You know, one or two holes at you know today, you might not want to clean it out. But you know, the next time, if you don't start out cleaning it out before you use it, then you might have a problem. So. I don't always do that, but it's a good habit to be in. When you sit down, you're ready to work on it, clean out the desoldering tool first, let it heat up, clean it out. They have like a little ramrod you run down the snout to make sure it's all clean. And that way you're ready to go. A lot of these will have filters. Yeah? One, one thing I like, I found, the plastic on this gets solder in it, but I use, use dryer sheets and you put them on your pinky and stuff and you clean out all. So not, not out of the hot part, but of the little plastic attachment that you yeah. are extremely good to clean that up. Yeah, some of them will have plastic, some will have like a glass tube there. You can kind of clean the inside of that out. Um, if you go off the deep end, like, I don't know, me, you wind up with this guy. Um, where I used to work years ago had these, right? This is this is not a new piece of technology. I bought this used on eBay. I waited and waited and waited until I found the one that was in good shape that I could afford. Um, Pace has made the same basic model for 30 years. Uh, it used to have a silver front, and some of them had only uh, two channels. This is a black front, which is slightly newer, but not a lot newer. Uh, but one of the guys from Pace told me that they sold a lot of these to the US military. And so they have a contract, they have to supply spare parts for an enormous number of years. So they make a newer version of this, which is better. But you can still find these, you can get all the tips for them. And I look on eBay for tips when they come up for a good price, and I'll buy the tips. Right now I'm waiting for a spare heater to come up for like the desoldering tool. You know, because I don't want to spend $100 to buy one from Pace. I'll wait till somebody has a new one in old stock on eBay for 30 bucks and keep it on hand. Um, a station like a rework station like this, it'll control, you know, one to more irons at a time. I usually only have the soldering iron and desoldering tool plugged in at one time. Uh, this is like a, yeah, this one is like a tweezer type tool. So for like surface mount chip parts, super quick to get stuff off. And this is like for uh, like quad flat packs and things like that. And they, they have various types of tools, but these are really the only ones that are important to me. But that's, kind of, that's on the extreme end. Um, the, the newer models, even newer models of soldering irons will have the heater cartridge and tip built into one unit, which seems like a ripoff at first. But the heat transfer on something like that is a lot better. And uh, these control the temperature really well, so the tips last a long time if you keep them clean. The, the new pace, yeah. And in your opinion, are 
Uh, the newer ones, the it'll go up to a little higher temperature to deal with all the, the unleaded solder. And they have the one-piece tip and heater cartridge, which is better. But uh, like a new one, a three-channel paste like this, the newer style, it's going to start about 1500 bucks. So, yeah, that was out of my price range. So, you know, this I found this on eBay. I don't know what the story was, but it looked like they used it twice. So yeah, it was in the original box and everything. So it was like, okay, but that's the type of thing. If it's something you're interested in, you just gotta wait till it pops up. Okay, what about questions? And then I'll show off some more of this stuff. Do you, do you think that the tip is important for a salary iron, different tips? Different tips, yes, that's a very good question. Uh, tips come in all shapes and sizes, and it's a darn good thing. Uh, heat transfer, right, is about the surface area of the tip and the solder on the tip. You'll see some old guides to soldering, which are written by people that never soldered in their life, I think. They'll say, put the soldering iron on the joint, and then after the joint heats up, press the solder into the joint. That's ridiculous, because you have no heat transfer. You need a little bit of solder on the end of the tip so you have good heat transfer. And so you'll, you'll see me a lot of times on the video and I'm not thinking about it doing it. I'll put a dab of solder on the iron before I go to the joint because I know I need some, some good heat transfer there. Uh, a wider tip will give you better heat transfer. Yeah. So yeah, I use uh, the one I have in most often is probably about uh, a three millimeter wide chisel tip. I use that for most through hole parts. Um, there's some things that's a little too big for. Um, I've been building a lot of the, the backpacks my friend designed recently, which is an SD card storage for these Model 100 type computers. And uh, for a lot of the, the joints on those, I'm using a, a fine uh, pointed tip, a conical tip, because it works better. But my preference is for the chisel tip for really big joints where I need to get a lot of heat into it, I'll use a wider chisel tip. For the desoldering tools, you have different size orifices in the in the thing. Um, for the tweezer types, there's different width tweezer tips, things like that. And you get the fancier ones, what will do the, all the quad flat placket ones, and there's different sizes there. But yeah, a, a good quality tip, right, in different sizes, in different shapes. The um, chisel tips are probably better, I think, for most things. The pointy ones do have their purposes, though. Um, I went to a small school system. Uh, there was about 60 kids in my class. So we had a, like a Model 3. I was thinking it was a Model 2 earlier, but it wasn't. It was a, like a, a Model 3 TRS-80 and a few Ataris. That was all the computers we had in the entire high school. There was none in the elementary. And I got to fix those. Because, you know, I said I could. I didn't know anything about them because that was the first time I had touched a computer. But, you know, I, it's like a mechanical electronic thing, okay? You just, yeah. Um, you know, I had a few computers at home which I had to fix. Uh, I remember probably in about 1990 doing a memory upgrade on a Coco where the, the Radio Shack had bought the bad 32K RAM chips and, you know, disabled half of it. And so you could buy a good set of RAM chips and, you know, take the old ones out. So that type of thing. I have done it pro uh, professionally, you know, like a electronics manufacturing and board repair and things like that. And this, I kind of got started again because my when my dad passed away, he had all of my old Commodore 64 uh, disc and books and things along that line. The, the computer was long gone somewhere. But I got that stuff, and I was like, "Oh, I want to re you know, be able to read these discs." But then you got to start buying the computer and the disk drive, and yada yada. And then you know the power supplies are junk, so you need a new power supply. And you know I wound up like picking up this Model 100, which didn't work. And um, then I just started doing the videos because I wanted to share, you know, what I had learned over the years with other people.
and maybe saves people some hassle to like randomly swapping chip after chip. Because you can, the problem with swapping chips is uh, you may not know if the, you know, okay, I'll take this chip out of this board and plug into this board, but is that chip bad? You can have a marginal chip that'll kind of work in one board. Uh, crystals will do this. You can have a crystal that'll kind of work with one clock generator chip, but not with another. And actually both chips are bad and it can be very confusing if you're just swapping parts around trying to figure out what's going on. Any other questions? Yeah, I wanted to thank you for mentioning that putting some solder in the iron, but um, not so much a question, but maybe even describe Like, when you're doing desoldering, you need to do the same thing. Yes. You can't just turn that thing on and start yeah. pulling, so go ahead. You, yeah, you let the joint heat up. Yes. Oh, thank you. I forgot to mention flux. Uh, flux is your best friend when you're soldering, whether you're soldering or desoldering. It not only removes some of the contaminants from the joint, but it allows the solder to flow out nice and even. And uh, I always, almost always put some flux on the joint when I'm heating it up. Uh, it'll allow it to flow out, especially if you have something or like we've had a capacitor leak or something like that. Well, now you've got a lot of corrosion on that joint, a lot of crud mixed in with that solder. Yeah. Yeah. Can you use the yes. Um, I use a combination. I have some electronic cleaner made by CRC that I use just to clean stuff out. And then I use deoxid to remove oxidation. Uh, there's some types you can get that has like lubricants for switches and stuff like that in it. So that's really good. But yeah, deoxid is another one of those miracle things that can solve a lot of problems. It's not the cure for everything, but it's good to have on hand. Um, it's my basement, basically. You know, I live alone, kids out of the house, so yeah. No, it's it's fine. It's so much fun, right? And there's so much stuff that you know when when we were growing up, right? You you saw all this stuff in person, but there's so much more than you know we knew about at the time. more about the tools and techniques of using the tools. Um, are those things that you cover on your uh, YouTube channel or do you have any recommendations for places to go? I do cover a lot of that. Um, thank you for asking that. It's, it's part of it leads into a question or a, a point I want to make. If you're just getting started and you want to, you know, work on your old computer, do something you don't care about first. Uh, I, I can remember I went to a vocational school and studied electronics and our instructor had this pile of old circuit boards from something, and that's what we learned to solder and desolder on, because if we screwed it up, it didn't make any difference. That's a good way to do it. There's a lot of kits out there now. Uh, soldering together a kit is a good way to do things. You see some things, it'll be like, okay, you have this Arduino board, and you build the shield that goes on it, right, and you hook up some wires. I have a friend that just did that with a um, SD card storage solution for an Epson PX8, I think it was. It was like the first time he had done that, right? And he made a few mistakes here and there. But, you know, part of it was like building with Legos, right? Just plugging stuff together. And part of it was he had to solder things together, right? And figure out how you wire a switch in series, which may not seem that complicated, but if you've never done it, you don't know what the terminology is, right? Somebody tells you to wire it in series, you're like, what does that mean, <clears throat> right? So, yeah, that's a good way to start out. Uh, there's a, so many good resources online now. Um, and you'll find with soldering, it's kind of like a, a religion. No matter how you do it, it's the wrong way to somebody else. Um, my advice with when I, in my videos when I'm soldering is I tell people it's not a race. Some people want to get the iron really hot and like dab it on there in one or two seconds. And you, that's not enough time to heat up the joint to get everything to flow off of there. So. You know, in, in production, when this thing, when these boards were going through a wave machine, they weren't on there for one second. All right, they're going through and, and they're preheating and they're going through this wave of solder like this, first through flux and then through solder. So they're, they're warm 
for minutes at a time, even surface mount stuff, right? That's probably a five minute cycle or so. By the time you preheat the board, you let it soak, you get that last little bit of heating, the solder reflows, and then you start cooling it down. Yeah, that shock heating is actually not very good for most electronic components. Um, no, just I tend to get like Kester or something like that, a, a brand I know. There's a lot of um, interesting no-name brands available now that I don't know what they're made out of. Uh, depending on the solder you get, you know, you can get a, a solder with a rosin flux, and you use if you use additional flux with that, you use rosin flux. You can get solder with a no clean type of flux built in. So you need to use a compatible flux with that. I really don't like the no clean flux. The fumes are terrible. Uh, the rosin doesn't bother me a bit. Rosin is like made from uh, pine tree pitch or something like that. So. What do you think on uh, oscilloscopes and analog or digital? Yes. Um, <laughs> They did, you know, digital scopes like this, even though this is a cheap one, right? It does a good job. This is better than the 10 megahertz Tektronics I had, right? It, it does the job. It'll do things it wouldn't. Um, yeah, I'm not married to either one. These are smaller and lighter and, and cheaper now. Um, and a lot of the newer ones, they'll have like, you can vary the persistence of the signal and keep it on there really long and get nearly the same effect you could with you know, with an analog scope. So, again, if you get a chance to buy a scope and it's a, you know, an analog scope, that'll work just as well. So, you know, use the tools you got, what you can get a hold of. Um, sometimes. It depends on what I'm doing. Uh, I have a grounded ESD mat that I work on all the time. And I don't fidget a lot. I saw this guy online. He's like, you know, if you're sitting down at your bench and then you jump up like this, you can generate this huge ESD spike. And I'm like, why would I do that? <laughs> you know, yeah, because you're, you're moving really fast off of your seat, right? You've got that sudden friction right there, sudden separation. Yeah, you're going to generate a voltage. But it's like, I don't have the need to jump up out of my seat that fast. I'm not on fire. So um, there are, especially old CMOS chips are very, very static sensitive and you got to be very careful. But other than that, I'm in the habit of, I've got my ESD mat there and I'm touching it all the time. And I'm not, you know, some people, I worked with a guy one time, we were working right beside each other and he could zap a circuit board every five minutes in the same environment, right? And it's like, I don't know what you're doing, Todd. What are you doing? Um, yeah. Probably, you know, other than having the strap, you know, just safe working practices. Okay, how are we doing on time? I don't know because my computer's not showing me the time here. Oh, okay. So no more questions. Okay, um, let's back up through the slides. Let me see if I missed anything. Yeah. Wrong button. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> what is it doing? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll talk about this test harness right here. Um, I have to do it one-handed. But this is something a friend of mine made, and it's what, actually, you know, he's a really good friend of mine, but I've never met him, right? Yeah, he lives in California. We work on stuff together all the time, right? And it's, it's like, you know, we mesh, and so we can do that. Um, he had a few Model 100s that were really difficult repairs, and so he came up with this test harness and wrote all the code that runs on this test ROM. And it, you know, tests the ports and everything automatically, and we were chatting one night and I said, you know, maybe we should do a, a loop back for this. And it was like in two days he had designed this board in this loop back cable. And, you know, 
me, all I got done in that amount of time was these two little boards, which are just a bunch of connectors. <laughs> but what these do, and this is again, if you go overboard with a particular model, these are extensions or some cables that go with it for the keyboard and LCD on this because you know, th those cables are about this long, so you can fold it over, right? And if you're trying to see if the LCD is working while you're making measurements on the board or something, you can't do that. So I just made these so I could, yeah. you know, have another 12 inches or 20 inches of cable in there and get have the test points right on the boards. It's made it, you know, very handy. And you'll see people have developed whatever type of computer you've got. There's people who develop similar things for those. Um, yeah, it's, they were made by Kyocera in Japan and, you know, it includes the Model 100, 102, the Olivetti M10, which is, it, the Model 100 board slightly reconfigured, all the component names are even the same, same leaky capacitors. Oh, that's another subject, leaking capacitors. There's like a, a religious sect, right? You got to recap everything. Yeah. Um, on the Model 100, that's true. Because 90% of these capacitors on here are leaking. That, that's what they do. Especially there's a lot of little 10 microfarad caps in the power supply in over here. And the bad ones will eat into the copper. Yeah. Can make a, real, a mess out of thing, eat the traces away. So this is one of the few computers that I will recap off the bat. Uh, the Olivetti M10, same uh, age, same design, same capacitors. T102, those are fine. I've not, not seen one that's had a problem yet. Uh, the NEC, the 8201, those, haven't seen a big problem with those. So. Um, no, about everything. But I, I don't know why exactly I got so interested in doing these other than this first one I worked on was such a pain to fix it was like a great sense of accomplishment that I got it to run you know um, and there are a lot it's actually a really good computer to use yeah. the keyboard is fantastic you know I think the the um, set of features that it had on it for that time period were really well thought out you mm -hmm. know compared to like similar models like the convergent work slate which had a ridiculous keyboard it had some really cool features like building micro cassette which could also be an answering machine but the keyboard was stupid. Nobody wanted to type on it. But these were, you know, some people use these today for writing on because it's such a fantastic machine. What about the LCD screen itself? Is it part of the play? Um, no, it plugs in. The, there's a few chips on there which are um, they're similar to standard LCD driver chips of the era, right? But they're in a different package, so that's the only place you'll find them. Uh, sometimes those fail. Uh, yeah, the um, I've had one bad LCD glass on a T102. The interesting thing is they're completely symmetrical, so you can take the glass out, rotate it 180 degrees, right? Plug it back in, get your zebra strips lined up, and it'll still work. It's pretty amazing, um, and I'm not sure. I'm about 50% sure it's the same glass as on the Model 100. It's just a slightly different housing. Um, yeah, but there's no replacement glasses. You're going to, if you have a bad, bad, uh, bad LCD, you're going to get it out of a donor machine. There is a guy working on a replacement zebra strips, so. Yeah, they haven't been completely figured out. Because what happens with the zebra, zebra strips are based on uh, a silicone uh, and uh, carbonized silicone. So it's basically uh, a whole bunch of layers. That's why they both the zebra because black is the carbonized layer and then here's clear, which is an insulator that's black and the insulator black and it's or, and then it makes a sequence of traces from the <coughs> go up to a sequence of traces that have been uh, vapor deposited onto the back of the glass. Uh, so when you compress the whole thing, the zebra strip tends to take a set. So if you find out that you have to take glass off or something or or whatever, you have to repair the traces underneath the zebra strip. You really can't put the old one back on again because it's already taken a set. So sometimes the compression doesn't make it equal pressure all the way across. <coughs> so working on yep. trying to make a replacement set. 
Yeah, it can be a one-time assembly type of thing. But uh, usually it's the capacitor, capacitor is that leak that cause corrosion that, that, that corrodes the uh, traces. And then a lot of the times the battery-operated device, you know, over time batteries can corrode. And since the battery, the, the, the display is right above the battery, if the display or the unit was you know, set on the back or on the side or something, then the corrosion drips on stuff. So that's usually what kills the display. Yep. The uh, battery corrosion drips onto the circuit board and then uh, corrodes the traces and then you can't, uh, you can't uh, easily repair them. Yeah, so Especially if it's underneath the zero Get the darn batteries out. <laughs> thanks, so, okay, thanks.